In his examination of small group ministries, Colin Marshall identifies several concerning trends that may undermine the heart of the gospel. He cites a testimonial from a small group member expressing the deep personal and communal benefits of such gatherings. The testimonial details how the individual shared their brother's illness for the first time, eliciting a supportive response from the group, including tears, hugs, and collective prayers for healing and faith. This experience made them feel the presence of God, describing it as a little taste of heaven. The participant notes that the small group experience has brought them closer to Jesus through strengthened relationships within the group. They emphasize the real sense of community, contrasting it with the more formal and less intimate environment of Sunday church services. The small group also fosters a sense of mission, encouraging members to reach out to others in need, further solidifying their collective purpose. Marshall notes that the small group movement has developed its own set of buzzwords, such as community, experience, and mission. At first glance, these terms appear fundamental to Christianity, aligning with core Christian values. However, Marshall argues that these words have acquired additional meanings and connotations within the context of small group ministry that require scrutiny. He suggests that while the appeal of such testimonials is strong, it's essential to challenge the underlying assumptions these buzzwords now carry. He warns that these buzzwords can reveal fundamental dangers within small group ministries. By promoting a sense of community and mission that feels more genuine and immediate than traditional church settings, small groups risk creating a parallel structure that might dilute or even threaten the central message of the gospel. Marshall's critique accentuates the need to carefully evaluate the language and practices within small groups to ensure they support rather than undermine the gospel's core message. In summary, while small groups can enhance personal and communal spiritual growth, they must be carefully guided to avoid deviating from the foundational truths of Christianity. Also, Marshall explores the significance of community in Christianity, affirming that God's nature as three eternal persons in a relationship of love and unity is central. Humans, created for relationships, reflect this divine design. However, humanity's rebellion has led to the breakdown of relationships, a pattern illustrated by the biblical fall. The gospel, therefore, is God's work of reconciliation, aiming to restore the communion between God and humanity, achieved through Christ's sacrifice. Christians are unified in a new society demonstrated by love, unity, honesty, forgiveness and good deeds, anticipating the perfect community in heaven. Marshall warns of potential dangers when small groups assert community over spiritual development. First, small groups might focus excessively on human relationships, overshadowing the primary goal of knowing God and understanding salvation through Christ. J.I. Packer highlights a shift in small group dynamics, where the pursuit of Christian friendships often eclipses seeking God, turning prayer and Bible study into bare tools for community building rather than spiritual pursuits. Second, Christian groups risk losing their distinctiveness. Secular groups like Weight Watchers or AA also provide genuine community, making Christian groups indistinguishable if not rooted in their unique faith base. Third, the formation of small groups might not be anchored in the gospel. While groups can form around various bases, Christian groups must be grounded in the shared character as children of God through faith in Jesus. Without the gospel at their core, these groups remain gatherings of Christians rather than truly Christian groups. Moreover, groups that prioritize community tend to become problem-centered, focusing inwardly on their own needs. Although supportive, such groups miss the primary Christian goal of spiritual progress. Instead, Christian groups should aim to grow in knowledge of God and obedience to Him, helping members see their circumstances through a faith-centered perspective. Basically, Marshall stresses that small groups should serve as a means to support advancing Christ rather than merely facilitating close human relationships. True Christian ministry leverages relationships to teach the gospel, pray and stimulate godliness, ensuring that the primary aim is spiritual advancement in Christ. Furthermore, Marshall acknowledges their profound and often transformative nature, recognizing the common belief that such groups bring individuals closer to God. However, 
He critically examines the overemphasis on experience within these groups, indicating several dangers that can severely undermine the gospel. Marshall first addresses the risk of creating a small group God when the aspect and will of God are determined by the small group experience. This self-made deity, shaped by the group's dynamics, might offer comfort and affirmation but would lack resemblance to the true God of the Bible, who embodies both love and judgment. The tendency to avoid the more discomforting aspects of God, such as his judgment against Pharaoh or the punishment of Ananias and Sapphira, leads to a form of mysticism rather than a true comprehension of Christian revelation. Secondly, Marshall warns that placing faith in the small group experience rather than in Jesus' mediation can distort the bedrock of salvation. If the sense of God's presence and closeness is tied to the quality of the group experience, then the assurance of God's favor becomes contingent on the group's dynamics. This undermines the absolute assurance of salvation for those who trust in the cross of Christ, shifting the focus from Jesus to the fluctuating nature of group experiences. In addition, Marshall analyzes the contemporary fixation on experience as a marker of spiritual closeness. He contends that various small group activities, from songs of praise to primal screaming, can evoke strong emotions, but these feelings should not be mistaken for genuine spiritual encounters with God. Labeling emotional uplift from a warm, affirming group as being closer to God is an unwarranted leap in thinking and can mislead individuals about the true nature of spiritual intimacy. To sum up, Marshall cautions against equating the small group experience with the presence of God, as it can lead to creating an imaginary God misplacing faith and misinterpreting emotional responses. Such pitfalls undermine the gospel's core message and the true nature of Christian faith. Further, Marshall investigates the evolution of small groups into effective teams, maintaining their potential to achieve significant outcomes when they are disciplined and committed to common goals. This potential often leads small groups to adopt a strong focus on mission, where the nature of the mission is heavily influenced by the group's self-perception and objectives. For instance, groups aiming for community naturally strive to draw others into that community, advancing a sense of belonging and mutual support. Conversely, groups that prioritize shared experiences work to extend these experiences to others, creating a dynamic of inclusion and participation. However, Marshall cautions against a narrow interpretation of mission that reduces it to social engagement, wherein evangelism becomes slightly an optional component. He appraises the prevalent tendency to view mission predominantly as a horizontal activity, focused on backing relationships and social interactions among group members, rather than as a vertical endeavor aimed at connecting individuals with God. This shift in focus can lead to the marginalization of evangelism, diminishing its role in the group's activities and objectives. Marshall debates that such a redefinition of mission often arises from an overly broad, holistic perspective that seeks to focus on all aspects of human need. While addressing social, emotional and physical needs is important, he stresses that this should not come at the expense of the primary mission of preaching the death of Christ to a spiritually dying world. He points out that this core message of the gospel is important and must remain central to any mission. Marshall's insights prompt small groups to critically reevaluate their grasp and practice of mission. He boosts a balanced approach that integrates both the social and evangelistic aspects, ensuring that the proclamation of the gospel remains a fundamental component of their mission. This balanced perspective, according to Marshall, is crucial for fulfilling the true intention of mission in the context of Christian faith. Last but not least, Marshall delves into the nuanced implications of small group ministries, reiterating potential pitfalls if the focus on community, experience and mission is misinterpreted. He recognises three primary concerns, anti-preaching, anti-minister and anti-church, Firstly, Marshall discusses the risk of small group ministries becoming anti-preaching. He disputes that an exaggeration on group discussions and personal discovery can inadvertently devalue the significance of preaching. When the group process in Bible reading is prioritized over the actual message, it can lead to the perception that sermons are an inferior method for learning about God, especially if the group experience is more engaging. 
This, Marshall repeats, is a misguided access. Instead, small groups should enhance the desire for robust preaching by nurturing a greater hunger for God's Word, ensuring that the proclamation of the Word remains central to the faith experience. Secondly, Marshall focuses on the potential for small groups to become anti-minister, often emerging as lay movements in response to perceived deficiencies within traditional church structures, small groups can sometimes position themselves in competition with congregational pastors. Some segments of the movement are explicitly anti-clerical, which can undermine the authority of trained Bible-teaching pastors. While it is beneficial for lay members to be actively involved in ministry, this involvement should not come at the expense of rejecting or undermining the authority of recognised church leaders. Marshall underlines the need for a balanced way where small groups integrate rather than compete with pastoral leadership. Lastly, Marshall underscores the danger of small groups becoming anti-church. The strong sense of community within small groups might be valued more highly than the extensive congregational life, leading to a reduced involvement in the church as a whole. This can result in isolated, unaccountable groups that operate independently, weakening the church's overall unity and effectiveness. Marshall warns that this fragmentation can be disastrous as it undermines the collective effort needed to make the church more fruitful. In essence, Marshall emphasizes the value of small groups in championing community, experience and mission, but cautions against misinterpretations that can lead to division and diminished respect for preaching, pastoral authority and church unity. In conclusion, Marshall examines small group ministries analyzing concerning trends that may undermine the aspect of the gospel. He accentuates a testimonial from a small group member who felt God's presence through communal support, contradicting the intimate environment of small groups with the more formal church services. This sense of community and mission within small groups often seems appealing. However, Marshall assesses the use of buzzwords like community experience and a mission, suggesting that while they appear aligned with Christian values, they may carry additional connotations requiring scrutiny. He warns that these groups might inadvertently create a parallel structure that dilutes the gospel's message. Additionally, Marshall surveys the Christian concept of community, implanted in God's relational nature. Humans, created for relationships, echo this divine plan disrupted by the fall— the gospel aims to restore communion between God and humanity through Christ's sacrifice. Christians, unified in a new society featured by love and unity, should prioritize spiritual expansion over hardly cherishing human relationships. J.I. Packer supports this, noting that small groups often prioritize Christian friendships over seeking God, potentially diminishing their spiritual distinctiveness. Marshall stresses that Christian groups must be grounded in the gospel, focusing on spiritual growth and helping members view their situations through a faith-centered lens. Also, Marshall comments the hyperbole on experience within small groups. He warns against creating a small group God, where God's character is shaped by group dynamics, potentially leading to a distorted intuitiveness of God. Emotional uplift within the group should not be mistaken for genuine spiritual experiences, as this can mislead individuals about true spiritual intimacy with God. Lastly, Marshall describes concerns such as anti-preaching, anti-minister and anti-church. He warns that small groups might devalue preaching, compete with pastoral leadership, and reduce responsibility to the comprehensive church, resulting in brokenness and diminished unity. Marshall underlines that small groups should complement, not compete with, church structures, ensuring the proclamation of the word, pastoral authority and church unity remain intact.